the uh, recording part. So um, I am. My name is Josh Fove. I am calling the advisory committee of transportation choices um, on transportation choices to order at uh, 709. We are recording this on Microsoft Teams due to the micro uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, hoping from the feedback that I received that we can continue to do a majority of these meetings as the law will allow virtually as I think we are able to get more people involved from a uh, larger swath. Um, before I started recording, uh, Mr. Marcus Gregory introduced himself and his role in APS. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, ask for, I'm going to go uh, a couple at a time here give you guys if you'll turn your camera on and just introduce yourself and say your role in um, ACTC and so what I'll do is um, I'll ask because I'm just going down the list as I see them on team so I'll ask to go uh, Dennis uh, Elizabeth and then Kristen sure thanks Josh Dennis Leach director of transportation deputy director DES Arlington My name is Elizabeth Kiker, and I am here as a parent of two, uh, well, of one elementary schooler and now two middle schoolers. And uh, Marcus, we know each other. Kristen, um, staff liaison for this committee. We'll go uh, Lauren Way and then John Carden. Lauren. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, this is Lauren Hassel, Safe Routes to School Coordinator, and I've met Marcus once at the office, and it's good to see you again, and welcome aboard. Hi, this is Hui Wang, uh, Kandi Transportation Engineering and Operations Bureau. I'm the Bureau Chief. My name is John Carton. Uh, I represent the Transit Advisory Committee. Uh, on this committee. Uh, let's go uh, Libby, Jillian, I guess you're using your, uh, your one of your child's uh, devices and then Dave. Hi, I'm Libby Garvey and I am your liaison from the county board. Hi, I'm Jillian Burgess, um, signed in because of APS as my daughter and I represent the bicycle advisory committee on this. Hi, I'm Dave McBride, principal at Kenmore Middle School, and welcome, Mr. Gregory, and thanks for your help with HVAC. And HVAC, I'm sure, as he will learn, is a perennial problem um, across the schools in Arlington. So, uh, John uh, Nickelweiss, and then I'll yield to myself. Hi, Marcus. It's John McAvice. I report to the APS School Board through its audit committee, and I'm also an APS commuter. Um, I am Josh Fold, the chair of ACTC. I have a middle schooler on the south side, and um, in my not doing this, I happen to also teach math for Arlington Public Schools. And we'll be off to a different adventure at a different school next year. So here we go. Did I miss anybody? Okay, I believe we are. Uh, I think I got everyone on this. So thank you. And Mr. Gregory, um, when uh, I hope you're able to come to all of our meetings, the this this month's meeting, the June ones across committees tend to be um, lower attendance, but um, you know, we, we have some pretty good conversations and it's nice to have all of all heads at the table so that we can talk about things and come to solutions. So thank you. Excellent. Nice to meet you all. Uh, so up next is um, we have the approval of the minutes and we have uh, the 2021 <clears throat> 21 22 minute. Um, I will say that I sent those minutes out and heard nothing back. So without objection, I'd like to approve those minutes. So moved. Great. So we Second. will do. Thank you. So we will move from that to 
uh, meeting dates. And um, Kristen, do we have Josh, some ideas on those yet? Josh, we actually need to vote on the. Minutes. Oh, do we? OK, yeah. so. Oh, I was trying to do it without objection, but we can do it voting style, too. Yeah. Uh, um, we do so a thumbs up. Just thumbs up. Yeah, let's just do that through. Let's just do it through the camera. Thumbs up or a hand up. Um, if you go to your emotions or if you can't do any of that, you type yes in the chat. We'll do any of those. I am seeing lots of positiveness on this, so we are good. OK, thank you. Kristen, uh, meeting dates for 21 22. All right, uh, thank you. So I've got got some ideas. Um, so as most, I think most everybody knows, we we aim for the first Wednesday of the month. Um, we meet six times a year, so that's September, November, January, March, May, and then we squeeze our last one in in June. Um, so we start school on August thirtieth. So the first Wednesday is uh, September 1st, um, or no, yes, no, the second. Um, do I have my calendar right? Anyway, we're starting on August 30th, so that would be the second. Um, so that's our very first week of school. And then the week after that, we, we have Monday off for Labor Day and then Tuesday off for one of our first um, religious holidays and is that Rosh Hashanah, that one, I believe. Maybe is it that early? Maybe I so. Think it's, yeah, I think so. OK, um, and so then the Wednesday, the, then the Wednesday when we get back would be um, that next Wednesday. So I, I guess my my question is, you know, is meeting that first week of school OK with people or um, would you prefer that? that next Wednesday. And I know once we start getting in further into the month, um, we tend to run into things like back to school nights and other occasions with that Wednesday. Um, so I guess I'll just kind of, maybe I'll kind of join, I'll just sort of leave that hanging out there and you can, you know, people want to email me and let me know what you think and then we can set that day. Okay. Um, I think that's, thank you. Um, I, I think that's best that maybe uh, if people send Kristen or you can send it to me. Um, I see, see in the chat, Elizabeth says she can't meet on the first. Okay. If we could get enough people who could that day, and I'm hoping to do virtual that meeting unless I'm told not to, is it would be lovely. I want to get it as early as possible because I'm I want to get some immediate feedback on how the year is going, and you know what hiccups we're seeing from across the board, or what okay. positives we're seeing from. Let's let me keep it positive from the uh, well, good we, we could be seeing across the board as well. So email me or Kristen and let's see. We'll try and get that out to people because, of course, everyone is involved in so many committees here. It just kind of you get into one and all of a sudden your dance card is pretty full pretty quick. Right. Um, OK, and yes, it is September 1st. I have first I have my months mixed up. I thought for some reason there's only 30 days in August when in fact there's 31. Um, OK, and then we'd be looking at November 3rd. Um, January 5th, March 2nd, May 4th, and then we, you know, the June meeting that we'd squeeze in is on the um, the last, one of the last days of school would be that Wednesday, June 15th. So um, I'll, uh, I said, I'll put those out there and you can let me and Josh know what you think. Um, so that's all I had on that. Um, and we can Kristen? keep plugging along. Maybe yeah. I'll call you tomorrow. What we'll do is I'll create a quick Google form okay. and just have everyone click it into those dates that you just listed and just click a yes, no to them and they can send it back and we can just get some quick data from people. OK, so, that sounds fine. Yeah, I'll talk yeah. to you tomorrow about that. OK, cool. Thank you. And thank you for coming. All right. up um, I don't know if that, does anybody have any questions about this meeting schedule or anything like that. If not, we can. Dispense with that one pretty quickly. Yeah. And, um, and I see uh, Jillian's got something coming in the chat. Um, maybe we can go on to the school transportation update and then I will respond to people in the chat as it comes along. OK, all right. Um, OK, just um, just briefly summer school. Um, we're pretty well done with our routing um, and uh, our 
let's see, summer school starts on the 6th of July um, and we'll be posting summer school bus information up on parent view and we'll have that. Uh, I think we're going to let people know it'll be up there um, on the 30th um, for viewing. Um, I think some of you, some of you may already know this, but we'll be clustering um, a number of the elementary schools. Um, so you've got a lot, um, like a lot of schools in the north didn't have a, a lot of students attending. So they are clustering at Glebe, um, for example. And then we've got a couple, couple other cluster locations. Um, the high school location is Yorktown and the middle school location is Kenmore. Right, Dave? Are you, is it Kenmore? I think it is. Yes. OK, all right. Yeah, um, my mic. OK, very good. So we're chugging along on that one. Um, so for the fall, um, we do know um, Josh actually alluded to one thing um, is that um, his program, which is New Directions, uh, is going to be moving locations um, to the location of um, Langston, uh, Langston High School and the Langston Community Center. So um, that will be a change um, in addition to the other school moves that we, we know about. Um, so we'll start working on those, those routes. Our team will do that um, as summer school wraps up. Um, we've got the new boundaries in place um and the the walk zones are being um developed or, or the walk zones are basically yeah i will say they're being developed because when you get new boundaries sometimes you know you might um the walk zones you know are bounded by uh the boundary itself um and the reason i say that is because in some cases we have areas near a school that might be walkable to that school but the boundary will then cut it off. And so like Nottingham is kind of a good example. There's some um, planning units up near Tuckahoe that um, I think are walkable to Nottingham or vice versa. And anyhow, they get um, they get parsed out to the school um, to which they belong. Um, so for the most part, um, our walk zone expansions um, are reverting back um to the original walk zone for that that school or the one that we had in place um we did have um we did expand some permanently we expanded um the one near innovation um that was a permanent expansion hop in boston had an area that was permanently expanded thanks to the new uh the street um back through um the wellington connecting 12th street um, or the 12th Street Connection, rather, um, and Arlington Science Focus, which is going to be the site of the new key, um, had an expansion uh, to the north of it. Um, now, um, there are there were four walk zones, and let me see. Um, I, I'm going to bring up Josh um, a slide, a little, a couple slides, hopefully. Um, that I'll just speak. I just dumped the share, so you should be able to grab it. OK, good. Um, so a couple slides. OK. Um, are you? I feel like it's oh, good. We can yeah, see. Yeah, it. we okay. can see it. Yep. OK, great. Oh, uh, no. So there were there were four expansions that really didn't require uh, crossing crossing support. Um, so Kristen, we I had can... it and then we lost it. Pardon me. We had it and then we lost it. Oh, it's not. It's not there. I just see a black screen now. Uh, okay. Anyone else seeing it? No, just just a blank screen. All right. Blank. Try unshare, reshare. Okay, I'm going to end the slideshow. Do you see it? Now there's nothing. So now just go back and reshare again, and we can all. Take a moment to love teams. OK, or I am just going to speak to the slide <laughs> on my own screen. <laughs> so, all right. Got it? Yes, there it is. OK, very good. OK, 
Um, so there were four of our expansions that did not require crossing support. Um, Abingdon, Ashland, Barrett, and McKinley. Um, Abingdon, uh, the expansion was into Fair was Fairlington, essentially the entire um, area of Fairlington we expanded into. Ashland um, just had had one area um, that was to the east of Bluemont Park. Um, Barrett uh, was uh, the other side of Lover Run, Lover Run Park. And then McKinley um, was north of 66, um, but uh, in between Washington Boulevard. Um, and there, the we had the Ohio Street um, Bridge there. So um, I decided I would go in and ask um, the, the communities that live in those areas um, you know, how they traveled this year. And so we just sent a targeted survey um, to um, families living in those zones. And the surveys are still open right now, um, <clears throat> but just asking them how they traveled this year. Um, and, you know, did they, uh, did they use any of the walking resources that we provided? Um, how did they travel last year before the pandemic? Um, a couple things like that. Just preface it, preface it by saying that, you know, when we have sort of major changes or shifts like this, it's always good to kind of come back and do some analysis about what happened. Um, and we like to do that, this a lot in transportation. Um, so I could start to get a feel for whether or not, um, you know, these expansions, you know, would be sustainable in the long run. Um, the other thing I asked people was, you know, how far do they live from the school? Um, because as we've talked about before, you know, distance does matter. So, um, as I said, I'm kind of waiting, um, just I'm going to wrap up those, um, those surveys now that I said, we, you know, we've only got two days left for elementary school, but things, you know, things kept changing. People kept coming in. So, um, I wanted to give people an opportunity to respond. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if there are areas that we could expand these, kind of make the most sense um, just because we don't have to we don't have you know major arterial to worry about um, and uh, we don't have to worry about you know crossing guard support and that kind of thing um, I did um, just in in anticipation of the a potential expansion for Barrett um, I did reach out to the um, folks um, in DPR Department of Parks and Rec um, because you know the they're citing a second bridge um for those of you that remember the big floods of july 8 a couple of years ago which happened to be the first day of summer school a couple of years ago so it was quite the day um the bridges all got washed out crossing lower run so one of them at the north has been replaced and then staff is working on the second one um on a second one and they're they said they have, they have funding for one new bridge. And so they've been doing some engagement to find out from the community, like where the where the best location to place the new bridge would be. So um, they've um, they hope to start installation um, sometime next spring and finish over the summer. Um, the fabrication for the bridge takes the most time. So I think that schedule might be, um, you know, fungible depending on how long the fabrication takes. Um, but they said they will be, you know, returning to the community in the next two to three months um, it, with a uh, proposed location. So um, at any rate, that's sort of one of those infrastructure projects that, you know, is near a school that we, some, we talk about, but this one is, you know, a DPR project. Um, so I just kind of wanted to um, fill you in on sort of that analysis that's going on um, and we'll, uh, we'll I'll be able to follow up with you on, on that one when I know a bit more. Uh, any questions on that one? Uh, I think we that was uh, good stuff right there and I'm not seeing any hands or any cameras coming on so um, what next? Did you 
was that um did you want to summarize hub stops next or was that kind of all rolled in there nope so hub stops um so did the next slide pop up i hope yes <laughs> okay um so you know this is the this year is really when we're gonna when the hub stops will really be rolled in um you know with the pandemic uh we we ended up you know we used them but they were not because of all of the 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 multiple parameters we were working with with the bus routing we never basically saw a full implementation of them we kind of threw them into a pool and you know in order to be efficient about how we routed the uh, routing algorithm because bas could basically choose any of them. Um, so, I mean, we had other issues with some of the stops, um, but we did not, we were not able to sort of give everyone their dedicated hub stop list. So this year um, is when we'll see the full implementation um, for our option programs. And we've already, we already rolled out Montessori Public School of Arlington and we rolled out um, HB Woodlawn. Uh, but I just kind of wanted to go back to you know the study that we did and the outreach that we did in 2019. Um, we asked people sort of what their top three elements were important for bus riders, just sort of generally, and of course, getting to school on time, having a short walk to the stop, <clears throat> and not having a ride that was too long. Um, now, what is happening with our option programs or our countywide programs is that and what we found is that by, you know, when we have that 10 minute walk, which is why I highlighted it, um, we are starting, we lose on the other two. So we've got problems with on time arrival and our bus rides get to be too long, um, which is why we, you know, kind of started down this path with hub stops. Um, so the other question that we asked that was specific to hub stops. Um, you know, what, what are the most important elements to you um, when it comes to hub locations? Um, that the hub stop is, it, is within a 1.5, is 1.5 miles of your home. I would um, posit that it's probably that people would prefer it to be even much you know, closer than that. Um, but that the bus trip would take less than 30 or 40 minutes to get to school. I think we certainly can do that. And there's plenty of space in the bus waiting areas for many students. Um, which is why we tend to use um, we use schools, libraries, and um, and community centers for our hubs. Um, so just um, in terms of you know who we'll see coming online this year will be ATS Key and Claremont, um, Gunston for the Immersion and Montessori programs, and then Wakefield will be Immersion AP Network, and WNL will be IB. Um, again, our primary locations are APS school sites, um, and we have been filling in gaps with corner stops um, when when we don't see you know these other types of facilities relatively close. Um, <clears throat> this will be you know it will be a change for families. Um, you know again we've talked about this before. When I look at other districts and jurisdictions and how they provide transportation service for their option programs or whatever they may call them maybe their choice or maybe their op or magnet or um, charter or whatever they want to call them um, there's a lot of different models but very few of them um, have what i call neighborhood style stops which is you know a stop on every corner or a stop you know that is within 10 minutes of your home um, and then close to home, I looked specifically at Fairfax County and Alexandria City, and they use their elementary schools primarily for like for elementary option magnet programs. Um, they use their elementary schools and they pretty much say um, you get yourself to your elementary school. And that's how they do it. Um, there's no, um, well, we'll try and make it walkable and, you know, it's just, you know, you get there however you get there. So I think what we've tried to create um, in Arlington is somewhat of a hybrid. We, again, we're using the school sites um, and then we're filling in with some of these other locations um, to make them more accessible. Um, on the communication side, we'll be sending out an APS talk to all of our option program families to expect full implementation. 
Um, and then what I do is I have the maps posted and everyone in their respective individual parent view accounts. And um, and that's kind of the main way that we communicate the locations. Um, you know, during the school year, you know, we have information up on the options and transfers page, you know, about, you know, hub stops being farther from your home. Um, we do include the information in kindergarten parent night. Um, but there's still those who, you know, are like, well, wait a minute, what, what is this? So I think, um, you know, we have gotten the question, you know, can you post these maps publicly? So I, you know, kind of wanted to get, you know, so, uh, some discussion around um, whether or not, you know, we think, you know, the committee thinks that that's something uh, worth doing. I think we've tended not to do that. Um, in the past just for our bus stops for you know safety and security reasons um but um you know if and or if anybody if, if anyone has other ideas for how to sort of better um uh explain or um publicize this type of information i think that would be you know good information to have as well so um, I'll throw that out there um, for some comment. So uh, let me run summarize what's in the chat first, um, and then I see a hand, and then I'll throw in my thoughts too. Um, so Hubstop's hearing key families are more concerned about dangerous crossings more so than distance. Uh, Libby brought up the um, uh, talking about that. Uh, with metro stop placements, they try to keep them within a half mile. Beyond a half mile, people start to get reluctant. Um, and but that said, looking at other models. Um, and then let's see here, just seeing this other one from Julian. Uh, kids in third and fourth grade don't mind uh, making their kids walk alone, but for parents, younger kids, they don't want to walk much longer than a half mile. So um, Julian, I see your hand is up and then I'll take other hands and then um go from there great thank you um so just to clarify that on the dangerous crossings thing uh, a lot of parents are like yeah i'll just let my kid walk but wait the hub stop means crossing lee highway or crossing yorktown boulevard or whatever and then they're like well then i don't want my kid to walk alone because that's a dangerous crossing so it's not a distance issue it's it's a dangerous crossing issue um but the um on the question of whether to make it public, uh, I, I wholly, wholeheartedly support making these public. I think it will help parents plan. I think it will help families plan because a lot of families don't always go from the same place in the morning to school and then from school to the same place in the afternoon. There's lots of activities, there's other caretakers, there's, there's all sorts of stuff. And so by making them public, it lets families sort of adjust according to their own needs. And then also if you make it public for the families applying to option schools and considering the various options in the school system, they'll know ahead of time. Like, OK, well, if I go to the option school, my best stop's here. Um, and I think that will help people, you know, sort of set expectations and understand what they can expect. I was going to I agree with everything uh, Jillian said and the on, you know, on the safety and security perspective, I actually ended up doing a lot of research because my own son was walking at a very young age. And this concept of the mythical stranger who comes and snatches up kids is actually extremely rare. Um, in the reality of it is the most often is, unfortunately, it's a family member in a custody dispute of some kind. And knowing where the hub stops are, since they are the hub stops are at street corners anyway. It really wouldn't if somebody wanted to do harm to a child. It, I don't think the providing of the list of hub stops would be the piece of information that they needed to choose to do so, um, especially since the goal is to place these hub stops in very visible places anyway. So I am for all those reasons and more. I, I like the idea. Um, Elizabeth. I just wanted to chime in in support of publicizing it just for more of what Jillian said, though I agree with you about the sort of fear factor not being valid, but or I'm sure it's valid, but you know what I mean. Um, but uh, that 
it, just because it looks closest on a map isn't always where you want it to be. And I'm sure you're going to say you can't like change your bus stop every day or there's bus chaos. But if the family says, oh, I see this whole map and this one actually makes more sense to us because it's close to work or it's close to a place we already are in the morning rather than the one that we have to cross a crazy intersection by our house for. Um, that I just wanted to say, I think that can be really helpful. Oh, yeah, all of that, right? Or that, you know, the way your house or apartment complex is laid out, you have access to a back door that in traditionally somebody else would not have. So absolutely, um, all of that. So um, seeing, Elizabeth, did you want something else? Your hand just need to come back down. Yep, thank you. Um, anyone else wanting to add into this? I'll give another moment for hands, microphones, um, or we will move to the next section. I see Jillian's going to add one more thing into the chat, so I will add that to the record once we. Um, it, it's that's not on this topic, but I did want to oh. say thank you to Kristen because it's been a lot of work to get to here on Hub Stops, and it's awesome. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let me. Um, do you, Kristen, for this next thing? Do you need your screen, or you want me to share? And on mute. Uh, no, I think, let's see, Lauren, um, where, let's see, we're on. Safe routes to school. Yes, Lauren's gonna give us um, a quick update on safe routes. And then let's see, has, um, and Christine. I know, Christine, yes. have you joined us? Yes. Okay, great. And Christine, when you get to your turn, um, if you'll introduce, your, I'm sure you have at other, Low times, if you'll introduce yourself to um, uh, Mr. Gregory as well, that would be wonderful. So, Lauren, you have the floor. Do you well, need to share you. anything? Um, just, uh, we did, since our last meeting, we did find out that despite the severe cutbacks in uh, at the state level in Safe Routes to School funding um, by 70%, we were funded at what um, we expected, given that, that news, uh, at about 30% of what we had gotten in past years. So we have uh, responded to that with a revised budget um, and activities list. And uh, we'll see how that plays out in the larger context of really needing a full-time person or entity to get the work done. Um, but that's where things are with that. And we did get funding, not everyone got funding. So that's positive that after eight years, we, we received funding even though it's um, a third of what it used to be. Um, and in the smaller um, dollar amounts in the mini grant department, I mentioned in the traffic gardens before, and thanks again to Josh to, for putting the, the photos together. There are lots more if anyone wants to see. Um, we also have uh, a second mini grant that um, Walt Garlington, uh, Mary Dalal applied for and received that installed a uh, story walk, which is basically dif different stations for one storybook at Campbell Elementary, but it's something that can be installed at different, it can be taken in to different schools. So we're thinking about doing that in the fall to take it to a different school, but that was uh, with great help from Bike Arlington, of course, Walk Arlington and, um, and Campbell, um, the folks, uh, you know, just helping to pick the book and so on. So that was a lot of fun. And we had some help from facilities as well. APS facilities built a little, little free library to serve as an information booth for uh, bike and walking safety information, which is really the purpose of the whole exercise. Um, and currently, as we wrap up the school year, which is when my grant year ends, I am um, finalizing the bike unit information to hand off completely to health and PE, which is where the Safe Routes to School grant started uh, low these many years ago, um, so that uh, the bike unit will be up and running again in the fall. Uh, at the elementary level, second and third grade students, and uh, we can basically fit in about 12 schools per year um, with about two week curriculum in um, bike safety. So it's a, a fleet of, of bikes and most of you all know how it works, um, but I'll be happy to share more about that in the fall. Um, and then we're also working diligently with Kristen and, and uh, the dream team planning for the school moves and working with hopefully over the summer um, principals and um, to get information out to folks who will be looking at new transportation 
patterns and hopefully habits um, for getting to their new campuses and providing them with all the resources that have proven useful to people when we were uh, opening new schools two years ago and then of course in the past year with the pandemic so it's just a um, kind of going back to some of the basics and uh, understanding that people when people are informed, they can make informed decisions. So that's what we're going to be working on. Um, and also working on uh, crossing guard placement, which is, you know, a continued uh, challenge. Um, and hopefully we can cover those priority locations we've identified. And then just kind of summer planning um, for back to school across the board, not just the schools that are moving, but um, everyone so that we have more bike trains and more walking school buses and that we can actually gear up and have kind of a normal year in terms of celebrating things like walk and bike to school day and uh, doing tallies to count the number of um, how, how students are getting to school each day and so on. So hopefully we'll have a little bit more of the normal for safe routes to school. Lauren, I, I want to say something while you're while you're here, and I know we have our county board representative. Because who hires the crossing guards? Is that a school function or a county function? It's a county. It's a police. Okay, and I think you know it's something we need to highlight. I think here at this moment is one of our struggles in walk zone issues is that the the job of crossing guard maybe needs more. I don't know financial assistance, some kind of assistance to make it a little more attractive because part of our struggle is finding crossing guards. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough gig and it's it's definitely a, a unique personality who um, who has the, the right schedule and the right, um, um, I guess, personality for it. Um, but it is it's something we've tried thanks to Josh and other folks who we tried to get the word out far and wide through everything from the 55 plus um, program to just regular HR to tweets and so on, but we, we don't have a lot of, uh, of bites and we would like to, you know, anyone who can help spread the word and help police find more qualified individuals who could pass all the many, many requirements to be eligible. Um, it's all for the good. Yeah, our, our police may have some insights about hard, how hard it is to hire and, and, and perhaps our staff here. Um, I know COVID was a big problem because you had a lot of people who um, were older and some may have just decided they're just not coming back um so that can be that can be an issue i don't know if um but we can probably think about that i, I think the 55 plus is a good is a good thing um and our aging commission too we might work with them i don't know if dennis or Hui have anything to add Libby, I'll just say a couple things. I don't want to represent police, but I do know because we coordinate with them uh, very frequently on a whole range of issues that they have real challenges uh, finding qualified candidates to fill these positions. Uh, they do have to meet basic background checks and, and, and other things. Um, and uh, the delayed start of the hybrid model of school, there were some potential crossing guards that were available and then not because um, of the delays. Um, but I think uh, special ops is the best to report on that. Maybe uh, at a JCTC meeting that that could be brought brought forward and talked about because I know that's a that is a it seems like a concern we've been talking about in this committee for a while now. Um, somebody had their hand up, but then took it down. Did they still want to speak? John. Hey, Josh, that was me. I just want to say we sent a couple of candidates over from our neighborhood for crossing guards, and I was just curious if uh, we'd been able to snag any any more, but it sounds like it's still still a big challenge. But I had noticed a lot of additional advertising, which was really good to see. So that's it. You, you know, one idea might be the Civic Federation. I don't know if we've done that or even do a press. See if they you could do a presentation. They probably have are all booked up, but that group tends to be older. And then they, of course, tie into all of the civic associations. So in principle, that should be a good um, format. Committee 100 might be another group to work through, possibly. Um, and um, I'm trying to think what the other one is that's similar to Committee 100. But anyway. I'm, Drawing a blank at the moment, but I, I and maybe we've tried those. I don't know. 
I am open for all. I thank you for all of these ideas because I know that's, you know, it's if we can make is, you know, Jillian talked about these dangerous crossings. If we can make people if we can make people feel safer and in these various crossings, then we can do things. But if if the parents don't feel safe or it's in, and it's not simply not safe without assistance, we can't really do what we want to do. And, you know, another thought, possibly, I don't know how much has been done with crossing guards just to interview them about how they like the job, what's hard about it. Um, there may be some different kind of models to do it. Um, I don't know if it's like, I remember we were having trouble with um, election people at, at the polls because it's so hard. You have to be there such a long and length of time and it tends to be older people and they don't have the stamina to stay the entire day like they have to. Um, and I remember suggesting, could we do half days? And there was a reason you couldn't. Um, but I don't know if there's something like that at play with crossing guards or not. I have no idea. Um, and maybe that's the, the, the checking has been done, but that's just another thought that occurs to me. Perhaps there's a different, you know, model or thinking out of the box way of approaching it. I don't know. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah, those are great ideas and we can definitely have conversations that are a little less uh, formal. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, now Josh, you muted yourself, I think. Gosh, I got myself. Um, the uh, thank you all. These are wonderful ideas. If more pop into your head, Jim Larson, your your mic is off. Did you have something you wanted to say? I probably did earlier. I'm sorry. I was uh, I was just going to go back to the thing that Lauren was talking about for bike and walk Arlington. We're glad to be helpful in this process. We want to continue to find ways to help you guys. And mostly, I think I shut it off by accident. Sorry. OK. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anybody. So thank you all. So next up is uh, Vision Zero, Christine. And I'm noticing signs when I walk around. I saw one going into Roslyn. Yes. And yes. on Washington Boulevard. Awesome. That's great that folks are seeing those. Um, we did put signs along county owned roads um, that were on our high injury network or entrance points to the county's roads um so yeah we're hoping that will they say slow down or um, those are the corridors where there were known speeding issues um or that says look for pedestrians or bikes um uh on other roads where there's you know um a lot of uh active transportation activity so hopefully you all have seen those around um and then I, I'm Christine Baker. I know you said to re in, or to introduce myself. I am a principal planner at Arlington County's Transportation Engineering and Operations Group, and I'm leading our Vision Zero program, which just kicked off officially um, this month uh, after the county board approved it in May. Um, so I'm really going to focus in tonight just on the items um, that relate directly to APS. Um, and the first item is. Um, uh, data-driven, um, equitable, automated enforcement. So that's something that we're really going to focus on um, with Vision Zero. And uh, great news, we have unofficially been awarded uh, a Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments Regional Safety Pilot Program grant. And that's $60,000 to support uh, the development of guidelines for school zone speed camera deployment. Um, because that is a newly available tool to us uh, in the Virginia State Code. We can put speed cameras in school zones um, as of this year. And uh, we don't have guidelines for those yet because uh, it's a new tool. So uh, we applied for the grant and um, we received notice that we will be getting the grant, uh, but it needs to be approved by uh, the TPB staff at their July meeting. So once that's adopted, um, we'll start moving forward. Um, We'll move into consultant selection in August, and then that'll give us project completion probably in early 2022. Um, so I understand that's a ways away. We want to get speed cameras on the ground as soon as possible, um, but this will really give us a comprehensive and um, you know data-driven best practice approach uh, to deploying speed cameras as part of the scope. We actually asked the consultant to do best practices research throughout the country, what other people are doing in terms of deploying school zone speed cameras. Um, and in the meantime, while that process is rolling, while we're developing the guidelines, we will um, 
I, at Arlington, Arlington staff, um, that's ACPD and DES staff will be working to um, incorporate speed camera parameters within the county code because that's not currently in, uh, you know, in our county code. So we need to a uh, move forward an ordinance to allow for speed cameras on Arlington roads, and then b figure out the procurement logistics uh, because we do not currently have a vendor um, that does speed camera work under contract. So that those are two big things that staff will need to be moving forward. So that should tee us up. Um, for uh, implementation in 2022, um, which is which is really great. We're very excited about it, and um, you know we'll definitely keep this group in in the loop as we move forward. Um, and we actually had a meeting today with communications and engagement staff on how we can begin engagement with the community on um, automated enforcement, particularly speed cameras, uh, in the near term, just so we can start to establish the goals and values for the community as we start to set forth. Um, the actual, uh, you know, placement and and moving forward in the process with deploying the speed cameras. Um, and so, yes, uh, a timing estimate when we'll see the speed cameras will probably be, um, I'm I'm hoping, earlier on in 2022. Um, you know, we'll try to maybe pilot something um, sooner than later, uh, but um, that that's still to be determined. It's still. Um, as we learned today, talking with ACPD, lots of details to work out. Um, so we're going to try to get that ordinance started as soon as possible and get it rolling. Um, DES and APS um, have also been coordinating on um, updating the school zone guidelines. Um, we, you know, are very preliminary. We're actually meeting on it tomorrow, so uh, you know, we're still very much in preliminary stages. But um, we are trying to incorporate a new aspect um, uh, of the school zones, and that's a 20 mile per hour static slow zone. So right now, our school zones are delineated with flashing beacons, and it temporarily lowers the speed limit during the school arrival and dismissal hours. Um, what we're uh, hoping to be able to do is more static. 20 mile per hour slow zones that just have, um, you know, signage that makes it 20 miles per hour all the time uh, around schools. We're not exactly sure how that's going to roll out yet. That's another thing that will require an ordinance that um, specifically identifies roads that would have um, speed limits lower than 25 miles per hour. Um, so we are looking into um, potentially piloting some of those in the fall. Um, so we are currently working on how to incorporate those slow zones and um, looking into potential areas to do those pilots. So um, this is all very preliminary. We need to have the discussion with um, uh, Kristen and Lauren tomorrow and then start to advance um, advance some of those recommendations uh, to pilot this in the fall. Um, and we'll also, uh, because it'll only be a few zones, look, uh, we'll collect before data so that way we can see once we've deployed how um, you know drivers are reacting how people are reacting to the slow zones and then kind of understand you know is this something that we want to deploy on a countywide level so um, that's another thing we're really excited about again it's really new I don't have all of the details yet because there's still a lot of coordination across APS and DES staff before we can um, move this item forward but uh, it's something we're really excited about. And then the speed cameras can tie into those um, slow zones later on um, once once we get that part rolling. So um, it, it's really cool. We're probably going to see a big revamp in the way we look at school zones um, moving forward. Um, and really, we hope that that will just uh, really promote uh, people to drive slower and um, be more aware as they're approaching schools. Um, Looking at pilot projects, um, you all may have seen that Lorcom Lane, we started a engagement on that pilot project where we closed the parking lane to enhance walkability. Um, so I'll send a link to that and let, if you don't have it already. Um, that is open, I believe, for two weeks. So I think there might be one more week left on engagement. Um, and then the second pilot we did um, was Curlin Springs, the lane closure from Fifth Road South down to Columbia Pike. And uh, we just finished a robust data collection effort on that one because it did have a lot more impacts given we took out a travel lane. So we will um, be releasing that data along with the engagement survey um, 
coming up in the next week or two, uh, TBD, but I'll, I'll pass that link on to Kristen once we have it and um, she can share it with you. But uh, definitely provide feedback on those pilots because that's how we know whether or not, you know, they've been received well, if they're working, what's not, where the lessons learned are. So uh, I'll send out those links as they come and um, please, you know, fill them out, share them with other parents and uh, families and, you know, just help get the word out because, um, you know, with Vision Zero, every time we do a pilot, we're going to do some sort of uh, engagement where, you know, we want to gather the feedback from folks who have used it to know, you know, what are the lessons learned? And that's really the point of the pilots to test something temporarily and then um, be able to, you know, see see the impact, see how it helps safety or, or maybe didn't and then learn from that moving forward. Kristen? Yeah, thanks, uh, Christine. These these pilots, I think, have been you know super helpful. I'm I'm um, I I know what kind of feedback we've been getting on Carlin Springs. I'm hoping we get some good feedback on Lorcom um, because I think that one um, it doesn't have a lot of impact outside of maybe a few people who are are have houses along the way. But I think you know making that sidewalk connection. Um, could really um, benefit a lot of kids who come from that area. So I, I hope we can keep that one. Um, and then I don't know how many were able to join the um, roundabout um, public um, engagement on, um, on the 10th, um, but that's another one that I'm really interested in, you know, seeing how it works. Cause I, um, you know, I think it's a very interesting project and, um, you know, I, I saw some of the, you know, chat coming through on that one and, you know, people were, you, know, you definitely had some longtime residents who were like, you know, it's really time we did something there. So I, I'm looking forward to hearing more about that one. Yes. Yeah, that one, um, I, I think we're starting to mobilize um, and getting ready to move that forward. Um, I don't have the exact timeline, but I can check on that. Well, thank you, Christine. And I, I put in the chat that I hope when you do put in the uh, the speed cameras that they, you know, the, a ticket from a speed camera is sort of an autopsy. It's an after the fact. So I really hope they are painted neon yellow with big signs warning people what the fines are, because the goal is to change everyone's behavior and then nail the people who refuse to change their behavior. Yeah, so. and the Virginia State Code does require that within 100 feet you place one of the, the warning signs that they're coming. Um, so so those will definitely be up and hopefully encourage that behavior. Um, and we're also talking about testing out some markings too that help to really reinforce like when yes. you see on the ground 20 miles per hour. OK, that's yes, that's how you know, that's how fast I should be going or how slow I should be going. Right. Well, you thank know. you. Thank um, you so much. So we got uh, a few minutes on TDM and then we'll go into our legislative priorities. Thank you for all your work, Christine. So Thanks. Uh, we don't we don't have a lot for tonight, but okay. uh, I didn't get a chance to talk to Kristen. But as you probably know, we've been moving forward with this whole TDM process with the school system. I don't know if the group's been aware of that. Kristen, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think back in the fall we talked about um, revisions to the use permit um, TDM condition set, and you know we got it through the board, which is great. I think we reported on that back in March. Yes. Um, and so now I'm working with staff directly on um, creating sort of the master transportation um, uh, TDM TMP um, transportation management plan um, that really applies to all the schools. And then sort of each school gets its own um, you know, sort of smaller, unique um, you know, add on that includes things like, all right, you know, how many racks does does this school have? And that's more, um, it keeps track and it, it's helpful for compliance. So that when um, uh, Jim, your staff comes in um, to look at how well we're doing on our use permit conditions, um, there, it's, it's a lot easier to figure out what's supposed to be there or, and what is there and that kind of thing. So, I'm um, still kind of a work in progress, but we're getting close um, and we should, um, I think our goal is to have them completed by start of school. Uh, thanks, and I 
We appreciate all the work you've been doing. As you probably know, Melissa McMahon and my group has been forwarding that along and a couple of people at the county. So we're happy about that. Uh, really quick, Josh, and I take a lot of time. On the TDM front, we're, this is just our work day by day, not just the school system. We're waiting for the governor to release uh, prohibitions about things that we can do in promoting alternatives like transit and all the other things we want to do. We hear, again, don't quote me, that June 30th, he's probably going to release that, which means the state will then allow us at our TDM programs to start spending some of the money that they've given us. I don't want to get into detail, but if anybody's interested in that, please feel free to contact me offline. I'll give you an update. Thank you. Well, thank you. And um, Jillian has a hand. Thank you. Um, thank you guys so much on your hard work on TDM. Um, this is an issue that we have been talking about. Um, we've been talking about since the very first Transportation Committee, and I just wanted to put that into context really quick. In the current CIP, um, APS is considering a proposal to build parking at the Heights, par build new parking spaces at the Heights, which of course is in Roslyn, our most walkable, bikeable, transit rich part of the county. And that, um, if they go forward, it's $10 million of our precious capital money that would be spent on parking. So that's a lot. Um, without talking about the merits of that program, I think TDM is, is hugely important so that we can save those expenditures in the future. So thank you so much for working so hard for that. Uh, thank you, Jillian. You know, uh, I won't, today is not the right time, but we're just completing a household survey with the Metropolitan Council of Governments of what our residents, citizens, and, and ultimately later, what do they do? What are their travel patterns? What are they looking for? And I, I think that'll be a future discussion, Joshua, and, and uh, also for, uh, for interest as we move on, probably this fall. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for this great discussion. And Kristen, I'll give you the last word on this. OK, yeah, just quickly, I did want to mention that with respect to the heights, um, there are some other things um, that we are building um, for that location, and they have to do with accessibility uh, features for the Shriver program. So yes, there, there's some parking baked into it potentially. There's a couple options on the table, um, but there are some um, pieces of the project related to better access for the Shriver program. So I think um, that's we can you know have that um, discussion at um, maybe the September meeting or something to get a little more information on it. But I think I mean from my perspective, and you know you all know me, I'm you know. My, my other car is the bus or my bike, that kind of thing. But um, I do think the accessibility features are um, are important for the students at that location. So I want to just want to put that that piece of context to it as well, because I think it's an important thing to uh, to know. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Kristen. Um, the next thing on our list and I am struggling on the best way to do this. So it's the legislative priority. Um, once and I sent this out to the group, but I know everyone's gets very um, bombarded with emails that the chair of the county board gave us um, a piece of homework that was not small um, asking about legislative priorities and gave me till uh, July to come back with some feedback to that. So I'm going to change my screen share and perhaps what we'll do is have a discussion for a few minutes on this and then maybe what I'll do is tomorrow send you like it, we'll see if we capture any feedback now in the chat. Um, but perhaps let you all chew on it after the discussion and then we can get some more um, succinct thoughts later. So let me um, bring that up. Uh, ACTC legislative. Part. Yes, here we go. So let me read them to you all and then we'll come back to them one at a time in case um, this is your first time seeing them. So the first one, and once again, this came from um, the, the county board chair. Uh, if the governor and legislate legislator could take one to three actions that would affect the work of your group, uh, what would benefit Arlington the most? 
Uh, given changes to uh, the state budget over recent years, what is the most important items to restore, items that could be expanded or items that could be cut? From your involvement in Arlington and the Commonwealth, what legislation can you anticipate in 2022 that might affect Arlington positively or negatively? Is there anything we should anticipate and develop a strategy to address? Among businesses, other local governments, other interest groups who would be our uh, natural allies, if any, both in our community and around the Commonwealth on any of these issues. And we are always looking for more to be more effective. We have a statewide team. Is there anything else that you'd like to suggest for 2022 legislative priorities? So that said, um, so I have that up. We'll come back through here and look at them. Um, that um, we'll go back through these maybe one at a time and have a brief discussion on them. I don't feel obligated that we have to answer all of the questions. If we don't, uh, a chair of ACE, uh, the Budget Advisory Council said to me, he says once he says, you always think of SITS, something intelligent to say, and if we don't have something intelligent to say, we won't say anything on that section. So let me run through um, these and like I said, I'm not sure if it's best to have this here as actions or just talk about what we think it means and then I can send a little Google form out and everyone who wants to can input it and then me, Elizabeth and um, Kristen could just get together and figure out what we want to send north to the uh, county board. I say north because I'm here in the south side. Um, so the first thing about is the governor and legislature could take one to three actions that would affect the work of this group. Um, what would benefit Arlington the most? Does anything stand out to anyone? Or, you know, like, any questions you have on this? Because I think maybe it'd be easiest if people could just um, wait for the Google form and then give me their real thoughts. Okay. So running through uh, changes the state budget. Hopefully some people give me thoughts of things to restore, expand, um, I think one thing we could certainly suggest is state, safe routes to schools. Oh, now I see a couple hands. So um, let me go Jillian and then Kristen. So I was just going to say safe, safe routes to schools. Um, safe routes to schools jumps to mind, expanded automated enforcement. Um, I think that uh, the dedicated funding for transit actually uh, complements our work here because as we know it's it's when lots of people are driving that people feel unsafe and then also feel like they need to drive their kids to school so I think that we've heard a lot about more investment in rail more investment in transit coming out of Richmond and I think that would be I, I think supporting that is great for Arlington generally but also complements the work that we're doing in this committee um, and then more, I, I know Arlington is, is generally in favor of more authority, um, but we, we, as we learn more about traffic violence and about what what is safe and unsafe, we find that there could be policy tools outside of infrastructure design that could influence Vision Zero. For example, there's more and more research coming out that larger cars are very unsafe. Um, and that, and particularly cars with very high bumpers, uh, trucks, SUVs with very high bumpers. And if we could, for example, tax those sorts of um, those sorts of vehicles more than we tax other sorts of vehicles, then we can help internalize the externality of the, of the danger that those sorts of vehicles impose on on our citizens. Right now, we have some restricted authority there. So I think asking Richmond for more authority to change how we distribute the car tax rate rebate, to change how we tax vehicles for permit for permits. Um, and I'm not sure about residential permit parking, whether we need a change to be able to differentiate there. But those are just some areas where we could we could use other policy levers to complement Vision Zero. And if you, when I send the email, if you'll make sure you'll capture that into a succinct paragraph, we'll see how we can make all that work. Yes. So thank you. <laughs> Happy uh, to help there. Uh, let's see. I, Jim, Jim, did you have to jump off? Because there was something that had occurred to me that um, had to do with um, um, having uh, his, his team. So in, in this case, it's Zara, right? 
now or the the support for schools um, that comes out of his shop um, just ensuring that you know we have we have that kind of support um, for school environments um, to do transportation demand management for you know students staff staff in particular um, and also you know how do we um, you know help addressing like some of the you know we talk about transit investments you know a lot of our schools live or are located in places that don't have like the necessarily the greatest transit access so you know what what kind of things could we be thinking of um to help um reduce vehicle travel um in places where we don't have a lot of of transit service um and then Jim, of course Jim is here and he has his uh, mic off too if you want him yeah, to respond he might be, yeah um and then you know how about transit for students we've talked about that before um and i know you know libby you you said at our meeting the other day you know it'd be great if um yeah if we had free transit and uh um what does that look like and we know that there are um state um funding requirements and operational requirements that our transit services are are held to that maybe make it more difficult and you know dennis you might comment on that you know to, right. to go to a free transit environment um so maybe we should be we should be thinking about well you know how how do we go ahead and you know count ridership um even if it isn't paid you know Jim, did you want to add anything and then Dennis? Well, I'll make mine short and we'll depend on Dennis to give you the overview. You know, a lot of things are going on right now uh, with Arlington and the state, as we call it, return to transit, right? That's a broad thing. We want to get more people riding transit and I'll let Dennis explain that. On the other hand, there may be some opportunities as we get past this restriction that could work. And I don't have all the answers today, but uh, I'll let Dennis address that. Uh, the only thing I was going to mention is that uh, Arlington is partnered with the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission, which is a regional body that represents all of the Northern Virginia jurisdictions uh, with WMATA to do a free fare and reduced fare study uh, for all of the jurisdictions in Northern Virginia. And that work is progressing and we have an active role um, providing input there. Um, and that also could shape potentially recommendations for changes in state funding and state policy. Well, thank you. It looks like we would have a lot of things we can definitely. So when I send this out, uh, I'll try to do this tomorrow afternoon. If people who spoke here and then maybe you have some other ideas we can capture them and then we'll work to put them into a unit. Kristen did you need a last word on this? No. I'll just say excellent to what Dennis just said yeah. and I'll add it in the chat. Cool thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so let me because uh, I won't be mindful of time here. Um, it's so involvement in from your involvement in the Arlington and Commonwealth, what legislation can you anticipate in 22 might affect Arlington negatively or positively? Is there anything we should anticipate and develop a strategy? So I will be interested if people will share anything that they have from their their lens and their perspective on that one. And this one, this one actually, um, I'm very curious on this one right here to, to see from feedback from people of this committee from a transportation lens, other allies or interest groups that we could be partnering with. And then legislative priorities, which I think sort of came through about talking about more TDM options, more free fair options. I think these are all just things that definitely come out of uh, this group. So I want to try to play catch up a little bit. Is there anyone who needed a last word on this before I uh, move on to our last part of the day? Okay. So we are going to go and I'm going to drop this screen share and I am going to switch to back to our agenda. And our last item on the agenda before, and there was a request in the chat at the end, 
if we can all uh, do it, if you haven't experienced together mode, but to do a together mode picture um, just for posterity's sake. We'll do that after we do this last part. So um, we are better know an intersection because we talk about expanded walk zones and then think in uh, impediments to expanding walk zones. Uh, today's feature is 18th and Ohio, and that is near Cardinal Elementary Way. Did you want to um, drive the bus on this and bring a map up and talk about what you know about it? Uh, either way is fine. Uh, if you already have the map, you, you can share. Uh, I, I, I unfortunately, I opened like seven screens and that was not one. Do you have it up? Not yet, so give me a sec. Okay, yeah, let me, because I, I I think I found last last month or last time we did this, it actually worked better when you were able to drive it for a little while so you could point out the features um, as you as you knew them and knew what might be coming with them as well. So I'm going to drop my screen share. And I will I'll add that this location sort of bubbled up um, to our attention recently um, through uh, sort of a com comedy of events. But um, we had a, the PTA president from McKinley, who's moving to Cardinal, said, oh, hey, well, you still have the crossing guard at um, North 18th Street North 18th Street and North Ohio. And um, I was like, oh, well, probably. And then I went back to our list and I was like, wait a minute, there is no crossing guard at 18th Road North and North Ohio, at least not on our list. And so Lauren and I tried to investigate like, well, did, did we have an SRO there or someone else? Um, and it turned out that it was, uh, it was not someone that was actually there, but rather one of the parents who would be moving to Cardinal said, hey, do you think we could get a crossing guard at 18th and Ohio? So we solved the mystery, but we all were a little bit confused uh, for a couple of days. Um, so um, it does seem like you know, parents are concerned about this. Um, Cardinal Elementary, for those who don't know, um, is the new name uh, for the elementary school at the Reed site. Um, it's uh, named after the McKinley mascot, the Cardinal. Um, so with that, that is our background on why this one came up. Kristen, I have a question for you, and this is probably for Josh as well. There is an 18th street and an 18th road. Um, are we, are we on the right one? Are we talking about 18th street, which is, I believe what we're looking at. There's an even more complicated intersection one block away called at 18th Road. I think it's going to be 18th Road um, because the parents were very concerned about the crossing. And so this is um, this is within the Cardinal Walk Zone. So it's one so block. Then this, uh, am I at the right one? This is 18th Road. I, I, think you, so I think you need to go down one block south one block to 18th Street North. Yeah, that well. looks fun right there. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I see. So you can you okay. can see um, yeah. from the overview that it's pretty close to Cardinal. Are right. we within uh, six hundred feet? I don't know. We can check. Okay. And a couple more sort of uh, threshold questions. Um, I noted uh, I looked this up beforehand and 18th Street North does not have sidewalks on either side of the street. Seems like it would be an excellent NC project um, to get sidewalks in. Um, and the crossing of 18th Street and, and Ohio is a very long crossing. We put in bike lanes, we've delineated the parking, um, but it's a lot of pavement. Yeah. Yeah, so we will we're going to put in a crossing guard request in here, although as you can see, it's kind of. Um, a little tough for a crossing guard too. But I guess I'm, I'm is it is or how are the, what is the what is the route that we take the kids on since there is no sidewalk on 18th Street? Are we routing them to walk along um, Ohio up to Washington Boulevard at the signal? 
or are we routing them on 18th, which is probably a pretty low volume street, but with no sidewalks? Um, I don't think we have developed um, our navigation. We have not de developed a navigation map for this this one um, yet. Um, so I think that's sort of uh, an open question at the moment, but obviously I think whatever way will be um, give the most comfort to the walker um, and that would include a place that has sidewalks. So Kristen, um, this is also part of the Washington Boulevard eastbound bike route, I guess. So uh, years ago, there was a decision not to put, well, to put a, a bike lane on Washington Boulevard westbound, but then eastbound to give a lot of space to parking and then instead route bikes through the neighborhood. And it's exactly on 18th Street here. And this is one of the, the things that people raised is that this crossing wasn't safe if you were on 18th Street. And this was adults biking, saying, we don't want to go through here. Um, it, it would be better if this had a stop sign for Ohio. Huh. And, and I'm not sure, I, I don't think we ever heard back from that request. It was kind of before three C's. And so I, I don't know if the county investigated whether um, whether to put a stop sign there. Hmm. OK. Yeah, we can look into our record and see if we've done a always stop uh, investigation there. So uh, uh, Kristen, you said you had a crossing guard there before. So was the guard guarding the crossing of Ohio? I assume that is right. The crossing no, of the um, we do not. We did not have a guard there. We were um, under the mistaken impression that there was one there, and then we learned that no uh, people were asking for one to go there. Okay, so I guess what Dennis said made sense is even if you have a crossing guard here. 18th itself is not really in a good walking condition because you have no sidewalk. But but the distance is so much shorter. I mean, percentage wise, it's it's way more than double the walk to go up Ohio and back down Washington Boulevard. If I'm a parent, I mean, I think the natural human tendency is to walk up 18th. I, I'm not sure unless 16th. Maybe you could convince people to go 16th to what is that? in street nicholas if that has sidewalks but i think that you would really be fighting up a current fighting against a current to try to tell kids and families not to go directly to the school but instead go the wrong way a little bit and then come back and walk along a busy road i mean washington boulevard is no pleasant place to walk along so maybe the answer is uh, to do like was what was done on Lorcom Lane? Is there space to do like a temporary sidewalk on on 18th? We can check the street west of 18th. Um, this doesn't look like a wide street, which you know it may make it more difficult because Lorcom is pretty wide and has that. Um, parking lane. So we, we can look into that and see what is the actual street width. I mean, this looks OK. Yeah, it looks really wide. And there's no parking. I mean, there's so few cars. I mean, obviously, this is whenever the Google truck went through. But there might be space. And if there's not space, it might be OK to have people park on one, all the parking on one side. Can is it an option to do like where they, I mean, I don't know if it's something, you, the intensity you want to go. I think about, uh, is it Hayes Street where you go um, past uh, Pentagon City Mall and there in front of the park where they kind of pushed the cars out a little and just left like a path. I guess it's a bike path, but it could be a multi-use path. Um, and that way you could preserve the parking and give um, a walking space. 
I can use those uh, those plastic candlestick things to delineate. Yeah, that's it. They put the the parking is on the outside of the protected bike lane on on Hayes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I. So I would say first option, first choice would be just push the parking out and put up plastic bollards like on Lorcom. Second choice, if there's not enough width to have that, is to put up the plastic bollards and say only park on one side of the street. If the street, because right now there's parking on both sides, I guess. And so if having faux sidewalk, parking, travel lane, travel lane, parking, if the street isn't wide enough for all of that. It looks like every house here has a driveway, so. It shouldn't be a big ask to say let kids walk to school. <laughs> is um in in addition to everything else, is it possible to get striping and all kinds of fun markings put up there with you know the yellow people walking signs and stuff like that? Uh, if if it's uh you know if we establish a crossing here, because right now because there's no sidewalk and no ramp, you can't even have a marked cross uh, walk here. If we can have that established, which means there need to be some work done at the corners, then additional signage definitely can be put in. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm writing down all of your suggestions. Some of the things, uh, for example, right now, uh, Condi really doesn't support having those uh, ballers, flex uh, ballers in neighborhood streets. The reason being, uh, trash collection, snow removal, street sweeping, they are all affected by those bollards. We've made a uh, sort of a agreement with our solid waste and water sewer streets bureau that we, we do it in the commercial area more often, mostly in those areas because we can rely on um, some of the uh, commercial, like, like the bids, they help maintain some of those uh, when it comes to neighborhood street, uh, innately there is a big maintenance issue that comes with it. Uh, having said that, though, it doesn't mean we cannot uh, further the discussion with uh, the maintenance uh, uh, groups and see if there's additional things we can do. Well, the only other thing I would say is that I'm looking at this and between the crossing of Ohio 18th Street, and then you have a very strange geometry of another branching street. Yes. Um, there's a this is a big physical area. Um, and this may ultimately even go beyond TENO tactical improvements. We may want to engage neighborhood complete streets or maybe even even ask NC um, and see if they've gotten any requests petitions for sidewalks in this neighborhood. These streets, everything that's feeding into this doesn't have a sidewalk. Um, and our MTV policy is that, you know, neighborhood streets should really have a sidewalk at least on one side. Um, so I think there are a lot of issues here. Um, I think we start with a traffic investigation and doing a little yeah. bit of reconnaissance with other programs that the county runs. Um, but I, I don't see this as being an easy fix to take a route that um, just has a total absence of sidewalks um, and how we get there quickly. Um, but I think we start with a traffic investigation. I'm curious, yes. Way, I see the stop sign and I see a sign under it. Any idea what that sign might be saying, like a warning of cross traffic or something? Uh, let me move, let me move. Let me move around to see if I, I think can it's see a turning it. restriction. No left turn. Oh, so we already know that there's turning issues here as well. OK, so then that might lead to tell us that there there has been some traffic studies here that you guys can pull from. I think this is more of the uh, cut through traffic type of older signage that you can see throughout the county. Yeah, this still yeah, has the time uh, time frame on there. We, we have. Uh, a few of these locations that uh, I think we we actually uh, don't um, we, we don't sort of follow that type of practice anymore because you know frankly those signage was the time the restriction may not be working anyways. 
Well, so I, I think maybe we I, can get out um, and do uh, some walking in that area too. Um, I know I have to get out and meet with the uh, the incoming principal on site to kind of take a look um, at the surrounding area, and maybe you can combine. We could combine that with a little trip out there, walk yeah. around. And Dennis, well, I, Kristen, I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate the need to do traffic studies, especially before investing, um, you know, significant dollars in an area. But I. I really think what will happen is the school will open and people will walk here. I mean, at this, I haven't double checked the assignment zone, but if, if I lived anywhere over there, that's how we would walk to school. And um, if the school starts to encourage people to double their, their walking distance, I think what people will hear is don't walk. And the alternative for this neighborhood is to drive, which is worse. And so I think not letting, I was going to say not let the perfect be the enemy of the good, but I actually think it's worse than that. By, by trying to say, oh, we need to do a whole study before we do anything, what we could end up with is people just driving to a school, well, let me, a school let me be, where we let have me construction. Clear, so, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think you understood what I said. We have okay. to start with a field investigation. We can't actually make okay. decisions about what kind of inter interventions are appropriate. I mean, the first step is to pull data, get an engineer out in the field to take a look at it. We need to know things like street width. Where okay, the I, sorry, where I the thought you meant like a full-fledged analysis, not just. I, I will tell you, I do think this area has a lot of issues that are yeah. not that are not easily or cheaply solved, and I do think it's worth engaging other programs in the county to see what they know. Are there requests out there? Are there projects in the pipeline? I think that's useful reconnaissance. I, I agree with that there. I, I just to point out one other thing, Way said there weren't curb cuts. And when we're looking here, it looks like the curb cut on the, I think that's the Southwest corner is one of those big 45 degree, like the whole corner is a curb cut. And then on the Southeast corner, yeah, where the where the hand was where the hand is pointing to that looks like it's the whole corner is a curb cut and over here that curb cut definitely is for 18th street so i, I believe legally you're allowed to strike that crosswalk well so we, I, we did, not, like dennis said we are gonna go to the field yeah. and check out the you know if these meet ada uh, requirements I mean, if we have a pair of a ramp and we can mark a crosswalk for the school uh, route to school, trust me, we wouldn't deny that. Yeah, uh, okay. But we, we do need to check and see if these things, because um, we probably won't be able to uh, tell just on Google Drive. <laughs> and, that's, and we're not, I'm not expecting you to say, oh yes, this will definitely be 100% the plan based on one conversation. But I think to, to give you some ideas to start with, marking that crosswalk, there don't seem to be stop lines in a lot of the intersections we've seen. Like if you keep turning the camera to the right, there's a stop sign without a stop line. Yeah, we right are there. marking stop lines everywhere. Okay. Starting this year, we have finished the south portion of Arlington and we're moving to the north. These pictures Great. are older. I'm not sure if we have reached this location yet, but it is in our plan to finish up marking a stop bar for all stop signs within the county. Okay, so great. I'm going to um, I'm going to wrap this up myself Field here. Trip. And um, with this and say thank you very much. Um, if other people have other thoughts on this. Um, I way thank you. I, I, I recognize it's the hot seat that you, you're taking a, um, a Kristen's uh, Kristen wants to do a field trip. Do we have to do field trip forms? Um, but the um, I thank you for putting yourself out there with this each um, um, each each meeting with this. These intersections we come to are definitely um, challenges, and if we all work together, it's really uh, it's really wonderful to um, together work to maybe get things uh, get things going on the various intersections of Arlington. So. I want to thank you for doing that with us and giving a giving a Wednesday night to it. So thank you. Yeah, um, sure. And uh, thank you, Jeff. 
These items will go to our collection of uh, place of interest. Uh, there are things that, you know, like uh, Christine has mentioned, identify slow zone, identify speed camera location. Those all may have a, I will say, uh, they may cross route with these intersection uh, investigation. So, um, Christine, I see your microphone's on. Did you want to have a last word on this before I go to the try to get a picture thing? Oh, yeah, I was just going to say that um, this is one of the, you know, as we talk about pilots in the fall, I think we're going to try to tie that into some of the new school, um, you know, with the working group um, and try to tie some of those in as we create new school zones for these new schools. So, um, yeah, the, the, I'm sure we'll be taking a much closer look at that. And um, it was good to talk about it with the group tonight. Yes, and I'll thank Wei and her team um, for always entertaining these things. I said, as I said, this one just kind of bubbled up recently uh, from a parent, um, sort of inadvertently. But I thought, well, this, you know, let's have a look at this because if people are asking for a crossing guard, we should probably know what we're looking at. Um, and sometimes our walk zones, um, they, uh, while we know that some are hemmed in by major roads, and we we've looked at them. Um, sort of as the edges of our walk zones. There are um, certain areas within our walk zones um, that can be challenging, and this happens to be one of them. Um, so I appreciate your team um, entertaining this. And um, yeah, we, we're going to be going out um, to create some of these navigation maps for the school because it's a new neighborhood school. Um, so maybe that's the time to kind of get out and, um, you know, put our boots on the ground and check out what's going on on uh, 18th Street um, Road or eight, I'm sorry, 18th Road and uh, Ohio. So thanks, Josh. Thank you, guys. Thank everyone for this. Um, so what we'd like to do, um, I want uh, it, it's Jillian putting the thing. If you're unfamiliar with Teams, there's this cute thing called Together Mode where you can, it will make it look like we're all sitting in a stadium. Before we do that, I'm going to officially end the meeting so I don't have to record us taking the picture. So um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn so I can stop the recording. So moved. Okay. Second. second. Without second. objection. Uh, so. Um, I would like to thank everyone for their participation this year. If they find, if you have someone who you think would be great to join this committee, we are always looking for volunteers. So let me stop this recording.